All right. Welcome back to another episode of Fitz Nation, episode 153, I believe. And it is a new era as we close out 2023. Um, Something I've been thinking about over the past couple of weeks, months, maybe, is that uh, the interviews are great. And if you like the interviews, fear not, they will be a part of the show. Today, though, no interview, fight talk about UFC Austin, about some recent breaking news, about fun topics in the world of the UFC and MMA, and maybe other things if we get to it. I want to bring on producer and a production assistant who's been helping me out with the show. He's a huge UFC fan. I believe he's a purple belt in jujitsu. And he's going to be helping me out, kind of uh, lobbing up the questions, if you will, and somebody to like echo topics off of and ping pong back and forth. His name is Spencer Shackle, and uh, he joins me now on Fitz Nation. Spencer, say hello to the people. It's great to get a camera on your face. What's going on, everybody? Happy to be here. <laughs> Very excited to join the show. Uh, we're yeah. going to talk a little UFC, aren't we, Fitz? Uh, there we go. Okay, so what's the Instagram at BJJ Shack? At Is BJJ that right? BJJ Shack, yes. Okay, with, and uh, Purple Belt? Purple Belt and Jiu-Jitsu, RCA Jiu-Jitsu in Las Vegas. Shout out. Yes, nice. So uh, he's he, he was on the UFC Fight Pass team. He has moved on. He lives in uh, Tennessee now. And one day he's going to open up the best Jiu-Jitsu training facility that's ever happened in the world. How's ever that sound, existed, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's the goal. There we go. Uh, but huge UFC fan. So we're going to have some fun. We're going to talk about UFC Austin. We're going to talk about the middleweight division and uh, what matchups I'd kind of like to see. And I haven't really thought too much about it. I'm going to kind of go on the fly. fly. But um, obviously, we just had a main event announced for early 2024 from Dana White involving the middleweight division. And there are so many fresh possible matchups in the top 10 of guys that aren't matched up. Spence, that sounds good. How was your Thanksgiving, first of all? I mean, I feel like we should recap, you know, holiday. Yeah, yeah. no, I'm, I'm sure, like everybody else, got to spend some time with the family, went down to New Orleans, uh, spent time with the in-laws. Nobody got in any fights down there, which was nice. How about yourself? <laughs> Nobody got in any fights. Is that, like, a thing? Some Sometimes. families are like that. Sometimes, Sometimes. they throw fists. Yeah. Never uh, know with the in-laws, you know? Yeah, so we kept it simple here. Uh, obviously, there was like no UFC event. It was good to I love the UFC schedule with ESPN now because it's like no no Thanksgiving event and Christmas and New Year's is our off season. It's really fantastic from a family perspective and from just like a, a life perspective. And you get to sit back and watch football and watch hockey. And uh, I'll tell you, though, uh, my son has a Thanksgiving break. That's like a whole week long. When you were in school, Spence, did you do Thanksgiving break? It was like Wednesday through the weekend, right? Yeah, pretty much that. Same, yeah. same for you. So, yeah, like I think we had a half day on Wednesday and then it was like long weekend, right? Well, my son, my his school, last Friday, they're like, see you in a week. So, you know, by Thanksgiving, you're like driving yourself a little nuts. You're dealing with the kids like all week, all day. So getting a little cold out. You can't, you know, go to a pool and stuff like that. So it was good to get him back to school. And I know you're young, Spence, and you don't have kids, so you'll find this out someday, uh, God willing. But um, it's crazy, man. Like, I feel like for the last four days, I was counting down until I could send him back to school. And then sure enough, I drop him off. I'm seeing him walk across the street. He's eight years old. And I'm just like, oh, man, I miss him already. Miss he's him like already. barely he's, he's <laughs> barely out of my eye line. And I'm just like, ah, oh, I hope he never grows up. Like, these are the days, you know? So it's just one of those constant struggles. Anybody with kids, you feel me on that. But um, yeah, it was a good holiday. And here's another thing, Spence, that I'm very proud of. Uh, I wo- I weighed in today less than I weighed in on Thanksgiving morning. Ooh, nobody, not many people can say that, Fitz. Now, not it's, many a big, that. it's a big accomplishment in Fitz 2.0. Anybody who's followed me on social media a little bit knows that, uh, you know, like the health and fitness, it's like that constant struggle for all of us. Safe Saud uh, gave me a weight loss challenge last year around this time, and I hit it, but it was all results based, right? Like I had to lose 15 pounds in like a month, and I did, but it was just like, that's not the way to long term success. So this year I've kind of crept back up and whatever. So I, I didn't have any sort of bet with him, but I was just like, safe. I need to fall in love with the process again. Like I need to 
figure out how I'm going to eat and lift weights again, more importantly, instead of just like starve myself and go for walks as much as I can, like almost like a weight cut. So I'm feeling good about that, Spence. Is that you didn't get on that Dana White 72 hour water fest then, huh? So I didn't do that. I have talked about uh, doing a fast um, with one of our people on our production team, RJ Clifford, who actually is on Sirius XM and he's, he's the, He's the stage manager on the UFC weigh-in show on Fridays. He's a funny guy, right? And uh, he's talked about wanting to do a fast like that, three and a half days. I think that'll happen at some point. I just don't know when. And I said, the road would be a perfect time because I'm not around the family and the kids and we sit down for dinner each night. But, um, you know, at the same token is like, you know, going out to dinner on the road. Like I'm going to Austin this week. Great restaurants. I, I'm a UFC staff employee. Swipe that UFC, you know, credit card. Like that's one of life's great pre- pleasures. Once you can get that expense report, whatever, right? To like go out and enjoy things and not pay for it yourself out of your own pocket. So we'll also, you don't want to be that guy that you show up. Everybody else is eating food. You say, "Hey, I'm actually doing something right now. I can't." Yeah, be like, hey, you know what? Bread. I'm gonna keep it to bone broth. Thanks. <laughs> right? Thanks for the offer. All right. Well, <laughs> awesome. Let's get into this UFC. Let's get into uh, here's what we're going to do, Spence. We're going to call this segment The Big Story, okay? The Big Story is what we're going to call this segment. And uh, obviously, the big story this week, fight fans, for those listening along, um, is UFC Austin. It's the biggest fight night of the year. That's the case. Uh, there's no question that it's the biggest fight night of the year when you look at the card up and down. Main event, lightweight division, Benil Dariush, Armand Sarukian. Co-main event, Bobby Green, Jalen Turner stepping in because of the Thanksgiving breaking news. And then you have some very, I would say, high stakes and fun fights before that. Rob Font, Davis, and Figueredo, the former flyweight champ, moves up to the bantamweight division. Kelvin Gastelum moves down to welterweight to take on Sean Brady, who I haven't seen in a while. Now, the biggest fight night events previously to this, this year, probably the thing is, Spence, I'm going to bring you back on here. The thing is, in retrospect, like this is clearly the biggest fight night event of the year, correct? I would say so, yeah. Yeah. And I was I was kind of racking my brain to think of before Nashville in August. Had had you already moved to Tennessee by that I point? Had moved to Tennessee by that point. Nashville does stand out in my mind, though. Yeah. Uh, Nashville was big. It was well, on ABC. Well and then Jack Jacksonville was, you know, supposed to be a big one. It was on ABC. The thing is, then you build the fight cards and some cancellations happen and you don't get the main events that you want. So, like, in retrospect, Nashville, looking back, like, we won't remember Nashville because Corey Sandhagen just took down Rob Font, who was in on short notice for 25 minutes wasn't this big, fun, exciting matchup. Jacksonville was Josh Emmett, Ilya Toporia. So you have Toporia's kind of rise is like, all right, he's going to be next at featherweight. Before that, we had Kansas City was pretty big. Max Holloway, Arnold Allen was a domestic fight night, whatever. But the cards were not loaded like this. And the way that the UFC schedule sets up is every fall when college football starts, we kind of go to ESPN+. Plus. We're streaming. We don't get a lot of linear TV time. The world is into college football. NFL season's going full swing. So it's very tough to like break through on a Saturday for a fight night. Uh, Pay-per-view is a different story. So what happens now is first Saturday in December for the entirety of the ESPN deal to this point has been our uh, memorializing Stuart Scott night, right? Jimmy V Foundation gets a benefit. Stuart Scott Foundation, um, the late sports anchor who died of cancer. We shine a light on people in the UFC world that have battled cancer and pay tribute to that. It's our, you know, uh, MMA or UFC fights cancer kind of benefit night. And as a result, uh, it's on big ESPN because college football season is down to fewer games. The conference championships are coming up. And uh, you, we just stocked the fight card big last year. I believe Orlando, Stephen Thompson, Kevin Holland. It was a big. It feels like a pay per view, right? And Spence is a big weekend for me because this will be, I believe, to this point in my career, the highest profile fight night I've ever done. Probably the highest profile UFC broadcast I've ever done. That's because that's of you know crazy. the yeah because of uh, 
the depth of the card. I mean, a lot of people have commented it's throw a title fight on top of this card and it's a pay-per-view quality fight card. Yeah, I'd say so. You got former champions all over the card. People have contested for belts. Um, Headlining main event, lightweight division. That's a really, really big matchup with two guys that have been there for a long time at this point. Uh, Moving up of Davidson Figueredo up to the bantamweight division, something that people have wanted to see for a long time. But he's just been going back and forth with Brandon Moreno at flyweight for a little while. You got uh, Sean Brady on the card, Kelvin Gastelum moving down to welterweight. It's a grid stack top to bottom. Yeah, it's it's awesome. So I'm going to focus in on the lightweight main event and then I want to uh I want to tell a couple of stories about Jalen Turner and then get a gist of Bobby Green as our like Austin preview. Um so here's the deal Spence and interrupt me if I'm wrong, please do. But there is a top level of mixed martial arts. There is the highest level of the sport and then there is the highest level of the promotion do you get what i'm saying here there is those guys that are world-class fighters world-class athletes all of them are world-class let's be honest but there are like two categories sometimes top level of the sport top level of the promotion and um when they come together magic happens when they come together magic happens when they come together sean o'malley with an army of gamers and fans and teenagers and uh all of that stuff youtubers pink hair all that he wins the championship in that fashion that he did that's when you get the magic that's when conor mcgregor happens that's when uh you know john jones rise to that level of of prominence as a a top level fighter who's uh, a needle mover who's a lightning rod in terms of love him or hate him or that sort of thing Armand Sarukian and Benil Dariush are world-class fighters. They are top of the heap, top of the sport in a, in a division that is loaded with major, major talent. They're not top level of the promotion, which is working against them from the, the title race, but it's still a, a very compelling fight. And if the UFC knows how to do one thing, it's to promote an event and make it a big deal. When you got a guy like Armand Sarukian, who's not going to register uh, with the common sports fan, but um, more to lose in this fight. I, I think that's the bigger question. It's it's going to be a great matchup. It's two guys that are pretty well versed. Benil has shown that he can bang, but he's a you know standout grappler. Sarukian has shown that he can do everything. He's very much that modern age of mixed martial artist where he's like just. I mean, what he did to Islam Makachev to get fight of the night on like two weeks notice in his debut at 23 years old. I mean, I think it's like world wants to see that fight again, I think, at some point. Um, More to lose, though. This is a big fight for Benil Dariush. I mean, this is huge. He fought Charles Oliveira with the win streak that he had in Salt Lake City. He was the betting favorite. If he, he was in that Leon Edwards position where if he won, he just you just couldn't deny him anymore. He'd have to fight for the title because Islam was looking for a fresh matchup. Uh, And, you know, uh, Charles Oliveira turned him back and eventually, you know, earns the rematch in Abu Dhabi. Make no mistake, Benil Dariush would have been in Abu Dhabi to fight Islam Makachev if he were to get past Charles Oliveira in that fight. He's 34 years old. um, He's off of a loss. And he is the type of guy that every buddy within the ufc world that's been around that knows the game that has respect for the sport i I feel like they love benil dariush i feel like they really he's one of those fight it's a fighter's fighter he's got a lot of respect because of how he carries himself because of the way that he fights uh his abilities his time in the game so benil dariush has everything to lose here spence that's safe to say armand sarukian he's had some ups and downs i think uh, you can make a case that he beat matoush gamrot and you know he could be on the cusp of that title shot in the top five of the division but the result is what it is so now he's punching up as an eight fighting four i believe for dariush but benil dariush i mean i think it's all on the line for dariush here i, I yeah. think his i think like the make or break moment of his career you could say is coming this weekend you're exactly onto that. It was one of those positions where the UFC just was looking for the next guy for Islam Makachev. Benil was right in the cusp of that. 
And if yeah. he had gotten a win over Charles Oliveira, it would have been in that slot. But they're not exactly rushing him to a title shot because you're exactly right. He's not the top guy in the promotion, even though he does deliver with everything that you want him to in his fights. And yeah. he is your favorite fighter's favorite fighter. Benil Dariush is that guy. But when you look at the common matchups that these guys have had, you look at Mateusz Gamrot and you see that Armin Sarukian had a close split decision loss to him. You see that uh, Benil Dariush was able to beat him pretty soundly at UFC 280. Now, when you have these two guys coming up together, you can look at that common opponent and say, all right, Benil Dariush is a little bit older within the division. He's a t- tried and tested name. We know that we want Armin Sarukian, who had a very close loss to Islam Makachev early in his career. We know yeah. that we want him coming up. What's the best thing to do here? Maybe have him fight a guy that has, is on the later end of his career and has been tested in that way and see if we can get him to a title shot. So yeah. I see you're exactly right. Benil Dariush does have a lot to lose in this matchup. And uh, while number one contendership might not be exactly on the line in this one, just because there's kind of a log jam at the top there. Right. It right. definitely is. There's going to be a lot of movement after this match regardless. Yeah. So, I mean, for, for Benil Dariush, it was an eight fight win streak that was halted by Charles Oliveira. If he had won, he was at that point, like I said, just could not deny him anymore. My question now is with that loss to guys like that, so, so damaging in terms of their title chase. Whereas other guys, guy like Colby Covington, right? He, you know, loss, you get him one big win, it's title shot. We saw that with Jorge Masvidal. You get him a win, title shot because they're so promotable. They they carry such um, they carry such a lot of weight in terms of promoting an event and fans and and stock and and crossover appeal from people that may not buy the pay per view, but Jorge Masvidal's here. And uh, as my friend Nick Pete says, and I think he borrowed this quote from somebody else, this is a sport that lives and dies on pay-per-view buys. And if you're one of those guys that can move product, uh, then you are going to obviously have a little more equity within the company. So for Benil, to me, that's the biggest storyline this week um, as far as the main event goes, is that it is all on the line for Benil Dariush. If he wants to retire and be able to say he fought for a championship and won a championship, he needs to win this week. I don't know if he can overcome two losses. I just think it's going to need to be another four or five fight win streak. And then you got to wonder, uh, much in the way of Tony Ferguson, once you hit 35 and over and you're in a division like this that's just loaded. I mean, look at look at Saruki. He's 20. What, what's Saruki? 26 years old, 27 years old at this point. Something around there, yeah. Um, and then like these other guys like uh, Gamrot, like we mentioned. You know, and uh, Jalen Turner's on his way up. I don't I don't think we've seen the last of him. There's always going to be, especially in a division like this, just a litany of guys 25 to 32 that are just a son of a bitch to deal with. Just hop out for Zeb. Yeah. You know, you just it's in that division that's not friendly once you hit that. On, on the other side of the peak. Once it slips on the other side, it's a not a friendly division to try to navigate. Heavyweight, different story. Light heavyweight, different story, right? Those bigger weight classes. But So for Benil, big week. Love the guy. Looking forward to seeing him this week because uh, he's just the most respectful down-to-earth dude ever. Um, did an interview with him on this show, Spence, on Fitz Nation. I think it was like last year. Yep. He was dry, his wife was driving him around in his Tesla. Yep. We did the entire episode. Classic car on, episode. Yep. <laughs> classic car episode, but it wasn't like the I'm in the parking lot after training. It was I'm driving around Southern California. And, you know, since he doesn't live in the sticks, able to keep reasonably good service for the nice. entire interview. Yep. So thank you, Vanille, for uh, joining me on that. Now, on the other side, Armand Sarukian, I think uh, just, just an exciting guy. Um, like I said before, you're seeing the next wave of uh, MMA fighters, and he's a big part of it. Guy that's good at everything, joined the UFC at 23, wasn't in over his skis. He's had some big wins through the early part of his career. Um, fight of the night against Islam Makachev in his UFC debut on short notice. There's a lot to like about Armand Sarukian. He's, uh, he's, he's got enough of a personality, right? Like, I think he's still finding himself, um, but like speaks English. You know what I mean? Like, like these guys from Kazakhstan and, and and from Russia that don't speak English, they're they're fighting an uphill battle. You know, mm-hmm. Song Yadong is learning to speak English. 
Zhang Wei Li is learning to speak English. I think they understand the crossover appeal. That's the miraculous thing to me about Charles Oliveira. He's become a guy that will sell pay per views. Doesn't doesn't really speak English. Yes, you know, yeah. I, I, like he would have been a worldwide megastar if he spoke English. Kind of Jose Aldo was in the the earlier years of MMA where it didn't matter as much, but now it certainly matters. And uh, and Armand Sukhan speaks English. He's got a bit of a personality. He's got a little bit of a dry sense of humor that I think uh, he's still got a chip under on the radar. Shoulder. But Last yeah, time, just, yeah, after in the post fight interview, he was talking a lot of smack to the top yeah. of the division, and it just it just wasn't continued online. It didn't continue the week after the fight. It was a few right. days. People had some headlines about it, but it just wasn't a big enough splash with the win that he had to really get over in that way. But Armin Sarukian definitely can hold his own, similarly to Islam Makachev in that yeah, way. Yeah, so I was just going to say, very much you know, like Habib and Islam you know. in terms of it's like a – it's a dry – I don't know if it's a sense of humor, but it, it's just like a – it's just like it's a, a no-bullshit confidence. Yes, yep. It's a no-bullshit confidence with a bit of broken English uh, from that accent that to Americans sounds kind of badass. Right, it kind of sounds like John Malkovich and Rounders, just like so, yes, send me location, no number one bullshit. I'm next for title. Like it, you know, it works. It can work. So Armand Sarukian, if he wins, uh, you know, he enters the fray, and you know that Chandler's gonna sit and wait for McGregor. Like you said, there's a bit of a log jam. Islam's got the belt. Who knows what's next? Is it gonna be Gaethje? Uh, Armand has a case for Islam because of how they fought the first time around. So great main event. Uh, what do you think? What do you think, Spence? You think it's going five? Well, let me ask you this: Armin Sarukian's a minus three hundred favorite in this matchup. Does that yeah. make sense to you? Is that a well thought out line? I, I there's Gosh, nothing man, in you his know. Uh, yeah fight catalog well, thus far that le leads me to believe he'd be a minus three hundred favorite over Benil Dariush. I mean, so let me state a disclaimer of okay, uh, I can't. You know, for some people that ask. Uh, I can't bet, right? UFC staff employees can't bet. Turns out now UFC fighters and whatever can't bet. So take nothing I say with anything. I have questioned lines before, though. Like when Korean Zombie was plus 700 or something, plus 500 or something against Alex, Alexander Volkanovsky. I'm just like, dude, Zombie, like he's a big swinger. Like he connects, whatever. Sure enough, like Volkanovsky should have been a minus 900 favorite, right? Like he just dominated that fight. Um, there was one recently. What was the one recently where I was just like, gosh, is this too big of a favorite proof that they all blend together? What happened recently? And somebody was like, minus it's like I mean, too Bo much. Bo nickel was no, no. It was like on the MSG. On card. I can't remember oh. anything. I used to pride myself on my memory and, uh, I really just, I I'm not good at it anymore. But uh, <laughs> in terms of certain things like that, there was a recent, there was a recent fight where it was, somebody was like, a. Oh, oh, Paul Craig. Paul, Paul Craig, Craig, I thought, was too big of an underdog. He was uh, a dog Brent, in that fight. Yep. Yeah, Brendan Allen was like minus 450. And I'm just like, dude, Paul Craig's like, he's been an underdog. He's won as an underdog. He's got a pretty good strength of schedule, up a weight class. Now he's at 185. He's 1-0. and He was an underdog to Andre Muniz, finished him, got a bonus. I was like, man, you're getting me 3-1 to one on Paul Craig. And sure enough, Brendan Allen goes out there and makes us all makes me look like, <laughs> are you an idiot? I, he dominated better everywhere, you know, and betting experts that I talk to Yanni and Nick on UFC fight pass that host the show. They're just like, like Brendan Allen's better than everywhere. You know, it was higher. Now it's lower. Like it's kind of a deal right now. I'm just like, okay, well, sure enough. That's how it looks, you know? So what are they seeing on Armin? Do you think? I Is think they're seeing, years? uh, I, yeah. I, I think it's, I think it's eight, seven, eight years younger, whatever it happens to be. Um, I think, uh, I don't know, Darius. It's also there can be overcorrections. We talk about this all the time. There's overcorrections in the betting market based on last result, right? Like I don't know how Yanni, the Greek, and Nick feel about this, but they might say Darius was just a favorite over Charles Oliveira. The betting market was determined that that was okay because they didn't swing it the other way, and he was on an eight fight win streak. And then because of one result against one of the best fighters of all time. Uh, and certainly the one of the best finishers in UFC history. You're just gonna swing him all the way when he's when he's higher ranked and whatever. So maybe they're saying there's a deal on him, but I think they're looking at a well-rounded, hungry fighter who probably should be on more of a win streak without that split decision loss to Matouch Gamrot. Armand Sarukian, uh, his win streak would be Olivier, Oban Mercier, 
Davi Hamosh, Matt Frivola, Christos Yagos, Joel Alvarez, the split decision to Gamrot, beat Damir Ismagulov, beat Joakim Silva. Now, the thing with a- another storyline here is for Armand Sarukian, um, uh, strength of schedule not in his favor, not his fault. I feel like a lot of guys haven't picked up the phone. A lot of guys haven't said yes. So this is a big prove-it moment. I think they're looking at faster, younger, a uh, bit more explosive and athletic, and I think they think it's his time. Like, he is the real deal, and it's time for him to back it up. That's what I think they're seeing on the main event. Yeah, you know, that was a yeah. knock on Islam Makachev for a while is that he didn't have the strongest st- strength of schedule uh, yeah. until he got to a title fight and held on to it two times against Alexander Volkanovsky, you know. Yeah, same thing happened to Kamaru Usman, by the way. A lot of people just didn't want to fight him. I remember in St. Louis in 2018, Kamara was already like on his way up, but he hadn't like, like he was coming off a knockout win over Sergio Marais, but he tended to win by decision. So nobody was like super impressed, but also none of the contenders really wanted to take their chance on him. He fought Emil Mech in St. Louis. That's when he said the famous like that was 30 percent because I think he was sick and people took it the wrong way or whatever. But like Kamara Usman should not have been fighting Emil Mech from Norway at that point in his career. Mm-hmm. Like he was very like a year later, he was the champion. So. Armand is one of those guys. A lot of people have not wanted to take their chance on him. In the words of Michael Chandler, I'm talking about a big money fight against Conor McGregor, not a fight against a guy with a silent T at the beginning of his name, right? <laughs> so he's just, it's just, you know, it's a its a tough business to, to carve your path in and even tougher in the lightweight division. All right, Spence, we're going to move on. Got, went nearly a half hour. I think yeah. we're off to a good start on fight preview. I, right? I think so, yeah. I think it's fantastic. I'm having fun. We got much more of this card to get through. <laughs> All right, I, I, I just I really want to focus on the top two, yes. um, Font and Figueredo and Sean Brady and Gastelum. I think we'll come back next week and more recap sure. yep. what we've seen. Um, okay, so breaking news from Thanksgiving weekend: Bobby Green was to fight Dan Hooker. Dan Hooker broke the same arm that he fought Jalen Turner or suffered in the fight with Jalen Turner. Uh, if you ask me, my fights of the year. And we'll maybe we'll do a year end episode in a few weeks and we'll kind of go over superlatives. But on the short list of nominees would be Dan Hooker and Jalen Turner. No question about it. That fight was fantastic. You know, who I was watching that with I was in the front. I usually don't go to the pay-per-views, but that one was in Vegas International Fight Week. And I asked my boss, I said, hey, can I just throw my credential and go down and watch it by the broadcast table? He said, yeah, no problem. I'm sitting there next to David Goggins, one of my heroes. And uh, we were watching that fight, and Goggins was like so impressed, especially with Dan Hooker when he yeah. like, got kicked in the face, and he just like just ate like, that. Head kick. He goes, "Motherfucker, ate that, ate that." <laughs> <laughs> like, so much. Fun. I was like, "Wow, I'm here with Goggins." Trump was 20 feet to the left of us. So, uh, Bobby Green, Jalen Turner. So Hooker's out. A lot of people were were pumping. Benoit Saint Denis, like, hey man, can BSD turn it around? He just got through Matt Favola in a first rounder. That would have been fun. I think, I think the choice of anyone, I think Benoit Saint Denis in less than a month, that would have been one of those great MMA stories uh, where it's just like, holy smokes, this guy from France comes out of nowhere. He starts blitzing through these prospects. He's he fights like a bat out of hell, beats Matt Favola in a can't miss fight at the garden, turns it around in a month and fights in a co-main event. Like that would have been badass, right? That was the choice. Yeah. Yeah. That could have been the uh, comms at moment where with the quick turnaround, just to catapult him straight to the top of 155 pounds. That being said, Jalen Turner is a tough matchup for Bobby. Green. I have a feeling, you know, it's uh, Bobby green is one of those guys like been back and forth, been around for a while he, yeah. he, in my mind, is 155-pound George Masvidal. You know, he, he's one of those guys that has all the personality in the world, all the talent in the world. He just has to put together a win streak, and uh, that's going to be pretty difficult against Jalen Turner. So that's exactly what I was going to say on the show. Bobby Green has Jorge Masvidal promotional potential. There's no question about it. He He's a fun fighter. He's got a lot of personality, speaks his mind. You never know what he's going to say on the mic. He's a bit of a wild card, even more so than Masvidal because he spits in the air after he wins all over Keith Peterson, just giving him, like, you know, the shower. And uh, and um, is, like, is street authentic. People like the street authentic. Yeah, you know? 100%. That they love that of aspect weight. of it. Yeah. 
So I, I was walking behind Bobby Green at UFC X this year. I mean, the guy probably had, I mean, I'm not even joking. He had 10 pounds at least of jewelry on 10 pounds. I mean, he's rings on the fingers. He's bracelets on both. He's multiple chains. He's iced out here. The, like I'm, I looked at him. I'm like, he looks like he's weighed down a little bit. I'm like, this guy's getting himself a little ruck pack workout right now. Dude, Bobby Green, he was at the Fight Pass Invitational, and he is loud in more ways than one. I'll tell you that. He's he's yeah. a down to earth guy. He's a funny guy, and uh, people love him. People love him for good reason. He's uh, yeah. he's got the bling, and uh, yeah, he could he could get it done against Jalen. So, and when you look at it, the potential rise this year. Um, so, and he looked great against Drew Dober last year. He was tuning up Drew Dober and then just flipped on a dime. And that's yeah. the power of Drew Dober. So then he goes, no contest against Jared Gordon because of the head clash and whatever. And that's so it's something that I forgot about when uh, Gordon said, run it back. And then Felder said, I think this is the answer. Uh, you know, I think that, you know, obviously it's not the result we wanted. And I had forgotten about that no contest result from April this year. I forgot about, I knew that they had fought, but like I said, my memory isn't as good. They all blend together after a while, especially when they're at the apex. And then I was just like, oh, that would be intriguing. Um, the fact that they, you know, fought to a no contest and it was a clunky result. And there was controversy surrounding it. But since then, Bobby Green goes out and beats Tony Ferguson and then main event, Grant Dawson. That was the arrival moment for Grant Dawson, and he got sparked. That was Masvidal, to borrow that comparison, against Darren Till. That's Masvidal London. and Darren Till. So that does was that Masvidal, make... Darren Till. Is, and, is this uh, going to be uh, Masvidal and Ben Askren? That's the question, Hey, man, right? if it's Ma – hey, if he goes out there and does something gnarly to Jalen Turner, who's a great fighter who can, you know, deliver some major – donny brooks you know then uh then i think he's off and running and i and then then it's up to the ufc do they give him like a main event spot to build an event around at the apex or on a fight night or you know third from the top pay-per-view card i think so, that's i think that's where you kind of maximize the bobby green that's what they did with with masvidal they gave mm -hmm. him ben Askren, third from the top and he went out and he delivered you give Bobby Green a third from the top. And he's been in that spotlight before. I feel like uh, he's been on pay-per-view cards before. But it's just, uh, oh, like against Tony Ferguson, for him, for instance, in Salt Lake City. So that so say you have a ABC headlining matchup. Mm -hmm. Would you put more weight into a matchup like that or something that is a featured bout on a pay-per-view? Something that uh, is Like obviously... what gets you more? Like what, what gets you more of a spotlight yes, exactly. and a thrust forward? I think it depends on the pay-per-view card. Mm -hmm. Like you're talking international fight week, third from the top. Uh, I would say that is bigger than a, I don't know. ABC headline is pretty big. Yeah, well, ABC headliner that. tends to be pretty big. But the thing is about ABC headliners is depending on the um, scenario, like in theory, your audience is bigger on the ABC headliner is network television. So the eyeballs on it, more but um like and then I, I think a lot of it comes down to performance and how the fight goes too but like what resonates like what are we talking about we're talking about are we talking about third from the top on an international fight week like Masvidal Askren obviously kind of broke through and became this viral sensation or like you know Yair Rodriguez fought Brian Ortega on an ABC headliner in Long Island now the fight didn't deliver but like I, it's very tough to say. I'd say you could flip a coin and it's largely dependent on surrounding it. The thing is about International Fight Week and about big pay-per-view cards, and I'd actually like to get a fighter on and actually talk to them about that aspect. Would you rather be third from the top on a major card knowing that unless you really do something spectacular, people are going to be talking about the top two fights more so than your fight? Or would you rather get that headlining spot but it's not like this sporting event that the UFC is just going to burn all the matches promotionally on. Like International Fight Week, Trump's in the front row. Uh, like it becomes one of the biggest events in sports because it's only baseball that you're competing against. So essentially you have the stage on a Saturday night to yourself. We, you know, we got fighters doing everything promotionally that they possibly can. We got as many celebrities that want to come to the fight in the first three rows. 
And it really, and then like on social media, we just get every single possible shout out uh, that our tentacles can get. So, but it's not your show, right? Like this summer, there was two title fights and then there was another fight, right? There was Drikus Duplessis against Robert Whitaker. Now, if you go out and do what DDP did, then you got to say, well, does that carry more weight? Or if DDP was a headliner on a fight night, does that carry more weight? I would, it's very tough to say. There's more eyeballs on you on a main event, especially on ABC like that. But I think the fight world gathers in the UFC promotional machine might be more valuable on like one of those major ones. Now you fight in Vancouver on a Nunez Aldana card. There's no question you'd rather ABC headline. <laughs> That's, oh man, that's, that's, that's the game we play. It's the it's game we a play. Very good thing that DDP and Sean Strickland got added to that card uh, that was going to be headlined by a uh, vacant lightweight, oh, a vacant bantamweight. You know, hey, they weren't gonna, they weren't gonna headline that fight. Hey, they weren't well, gonna headline. They were all, they were waiting. They were was, looking. They were waiting. They were figuring out who they were gonna pay. They were not gonna headline Raquel Pennington and um, Juliana Pena. Juliana Pena. No, no, no. Yes, no, it's I'll, not Pena. Isn't it? Well, no, no, no. Th that just shows because no, Pena's, of this Pena's fight. arguing. Pena's arguing about how it's. Uh, uh, I can't believe I'm forgetting. Pennington and Myra Bueno Silva. Oh, that is Pennington right. That and is, Myra Bueno Silva and Pena's like, oh, it's a shame that they're putting on that fight. So yeah, they yeah. weren't. They were not going to headline those two. That was always going to be a co-main. But, okay. uh, you know, and then so they figured out that it'll be Strickland and DDP. OK, quick couple of Jalen Turner stories, just because I've had him on the pod in the past. And these are fun stories. The way that he got into MMA. Right. Uh, just, there's like two two parts of the story. He got into MMA um, after high school. I think he wrestled. Didn't really know what he was going to do with his life. Didn't have plans to go to college. Didn't have a clear uh, career path. Shadow boxed, uh, I believe, a couch or a mattress in his garage. Shadow box, like watched Anderson Silva videos. Shadow boxed, thought he was a badass Spence because he would shadow box for thirty minutes and he wasn't tired. And then he'd watch the UFC and he's just like, these guys are gassed after fifteen minutes. What a bunch of <laughs> pussies! So uh, he was a little, it was a little naive, a little ignorant on that. He laughs about it now. And then he was kind of like backyard fight club. And he went against a, a friend of his that had like experience, like trained a little in the martial arts, did well against him. So he's just like, OK, I'm going to go be the UFC champion. Like, that's that's just what I'm going to do now. The way that he actually joined like an MMA gym is he uh, a, a girl, a girlfriend of his dumped him, got dumped. Spence was heartbroken. Right. And he couldn't take seeing her on Facebook right? The, the old ex-girlfriends out having a good time, whatever. He was heartbroken. He was signing on to Facebook to delete his account. Signing on to Facebook, deactivated. I can't handle it anymore. I just got to delete my Facebook account. First thing that he pops up when he signs on to Facebook, MMA team tryouts happening near him. And so he took that as a sign from God. He said, if this isn't a sign from God, I don't know what is. Says, I'm going to go to these MMA tryouts and see if I can like make whatever amateur team they're putting together. Needed like 20 bucks and a mouth guard and a cup. And so he got the 20 bucks from his mom, um, but didn't have the money to buy a mouth guard and a cup. But I think the statute of limitations applies here. I think we're good. Goes into sports authority, jacks them, shop lifting, mouth guard, cup, Goes to MMA tryouts. He's in the UFC. He's in a co-main event this weekend. Well, for whatever it's worth, I'm sure that he could send some money in the mail to Dick Sporting Goods or whatever. But that's yeah. that's a great story. If only I mean, we're talking, uh, you know, we're talking about like twenty four ninety five total. Yeah. Although, and, <laughs> yeah. you know, inflation probably like forty dollars these days for a cup and a mouth guard. We'll see. But um, that's a hell of a target ad. So that's you know? that's just yeah, that's one of those things for uh, Jay. Th those are the stories that I just love that this sport provides. I mean. You don't you get those stories in other sports. You certainly do rags to riches and, you know, coming from, uh, you know, sharing a bedroom with five siblings and then you go play football at Alabama or, you know, pick the major school and then you go. But but uh, the, the the MMA humble beginnings are quite something. They're, they're very much a rocky story in real life. And uh, I think that's part of the thing why we love it. So uh, major props to Jalen Turner. I'm interested to see what he looks like on the scale and making weight. Cause he's just a big body for the weight class and he's missed weight before. 
and sort of take the fight on a week and a half notice. I'm going to touch base with him and see how his Thanksgiving meal uh, was it altered. I'm sure it was. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's a great, it's a great co-main. I think so too. Yeah. I, I think uh, right now Jalen Turner is a sizable favorite, which is just a little surprising considering yeah. that he's coming off on a week and a week and a half notice. Yeah. Week and a half notice. Um, I mean, he's younger, he's longer. He's got all the skills in the world. Was Hooker the favorite? Hooker must have been the favorite. Hooker was, uh, it was pretty even money, but slight favorite. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, all right. Let's move on to other headlines, Spence. What do we got? What did we learn in the last week or so? Well, um, we do have UFC 298 in Anaheim. Volkanovski Anaheim is the location. February, Anaheim, Honda Center. Haven't been back since uh, in Ganu and Gone. And uh, so that'd be fun. Good location. Don't hate it. Right. Good stage for Ilya Toporia. Uh, Southern so. California market, LA market. Volk will carry the promotional load for that event. He's crossed through. He's become every bit of that guy that you can build a pay-per-view event around and people will tune in. He's got a lot of respect with fans. Sports fans across the board, I think, are starting to see his name so frequently now. And uh, here with uh, the respect that fight fans talk about him that I think, I think it's good. I think it deserved and uh, it's a good market. I'm, I'm excited for Topuria to get a spotlight. He's been talking himself up. I think Topuria is a guy who, uh, who has potential, right? Like Spain, new European market, uh, relatively speaking and uh, major test if he can pass it. And he's got, you know, a stage in the Southern California, Los Angeles area to do it on. You know, he's one of the few guys at featherweight that if you mention his name in a fight with Ale Alexander Volkanovsky, you won't immediately get laughed out of the room. And I think that mm -hmm. that's something that definitely carried him to this title opportunity. Um, yeah. My question is, you know, he's coming off of a very late minute replacement fight against Islam Makachev that he obviously did not win. But yeah. there's been talk now coming into this saying, is it too quick of a turnaround after the knockout? Um, I, he has a few months of actual preparation and we know that he didn't prep for that last fight. He couldn't mm -hmm. have prepped for that last fight the way that he right. would have liked to, um, right. is he coming and turn this around too quickly? I don't know, man. Uh, he wasn't knocked out cold, you know, and we'll get into this in the next year where we're like, you know, kind of dive in on this fight further. I'm sure more stuff will come out. I think you'll see a very, very good version of Volkanovsky. I think the, the intriguing part of this one is that. This summer, when it was Volk against Yair Rodriguez, I don't know how many people were giving Yair Rodriguez a chance. There was a chance it was a fun fight, and I think we had seen enough, and Yair's a highlight reel and whatever. But like somebody asked me, they're just like, oh, so what's what's the deal here? Is this guy, does this guy from Mexico have a chance, or is this is Volk just too good? And I was just like, you know, Volk probably just too good, right? Like he was just he was like a step up. I think there's a lot of intrigue here because it's um uh, it's it's like a new wave of contender that's been very, very impressive on the way up. So, um, I don't know, at least in my head, I give Topuria more of a chance than I gave Vulcan, uh, than I gave Rodriguez, but, uh, you know, I don't want to spend too much time on that. We'll dive into that as the fight gets closer, but Anaheim was the announcement from Dana. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's a great spot. Are you, are you going to be in attendance for that one? No, I won't. I probably not. I mean, you never know. Sometimes I get a late call to like go support and do other things and it's not too far away. So maybe, but probably not. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I like that fight. Uh, otherwise, on the news, we got Gordon Ryan injured out of the oh. Fight Pass Invitational 5. That's a blow. That really is. Cause that Tell fight me about the Fight Pass Invitational real quick, if you could, about like as a jujitsu practitioner and expert, is it looked at as – I know they're punching up and trying to make it the events in the jujitsu world. And this one was supposed to have GSP returning – and Gordon Ryan competing on the same card. And so this one probably would have been top of the heap in terms of any profile of a jujitsu card event, whatever, right? Yes, yes. That was when GSP was first announced to be on this card. It was one of those things where, okay, this could finally usher the sport of jujitsu into a real mainstream, capturing a lot of the MMA fan base, getting them involved in watching a jujitsu card that has world class talent on it that they could then become invested in. But then, two, also seeing one of the legends of MMA compete in a sport that isn't boxing. And yeah. I think that um, 
Gordon Ryan versus Mason Fowler. Once GSP got injured, he's still going to be there on commentary. Once that was going to be a main event that uh, is a matchup that Gordon has not had before against a dude who won the first uh, absolute tournament at the Fight Pass Invitational um, 2 that was supposed to be setting up basically a contender for Gordon. And as far as the Invitational goes, it is the owned and operated jiu-jitsu event of the UFC it's not the prestige of ADCC. It's not uh, accepted to be the Olympics of jiu-jitsu at this point. But if you're talking about the Fight Pass Invitational, you're talking about world-class production being invested into the sport of jiu-jitsu and the ability to, ring, to bring in guys like Nicky Rod, guys like right. Nicholas Marigali, guys like Craig Jones, Fleet Pena, Gordon Ryan, the best in the world to com- compete under one roof. And the absolute tournament that they've been putting on for the last few events has been fantastic. Nikki Rod uh, beat Big Dan Montessori in this most recent one for the um, absolute tournament finale mm-hmm. in one of the most dramatic armbar escapes that I've ever seen. Um, wow. That was a it, it puts jujitsu on a world stage in a way that um, there just isn't distribution otherwise for at this point. Right. Right. And there's been a lot of conversation getting built up around it. And this event is still a great event. It's got a lot of great matches on it, but not having Gordon on top of the card with Mason Fowler definitely is a blow. Yeah. It, it just, uh, it takes some of the crossover appeal. Like I, you know, like, and I'll check it out. Cause I like watching it and TJ DeSantis will announce it. And like, obviously I'm entrenched in the fight pass team. So I support what they do. Um, but yeah, like, like Gordon Ryan competing, like, I haven't actually, you know, sat there and watched Gordon Ryan yet, but like he made some headlines because he called the way that he was going to win. What was that? A flow grappling. And he was like, I'm going to win by this and I'll show you. And he he did. And then he showed it's like, he's he's that arrogant. I'm the greatest of all time, but he's backed it up. He's got the incredible win streak. So, um, but I will look forward to uh, Gordon competing on UFC Fight Pass. That will happen. The deal with GSP is still in place. It'll just have to happen. And maybe they put those two on the first card of next year or whenever they can return so it can make a splash. Also thought it was cool that Anthony Smith fought Glover to share Like you can get that UFC crossover to see. And, and that exists elsewhere too, but for to have it be the UFC Fight Pass event for that. Pretty cool. Uh, rough news, you know, that, that Gordon's out and GSP is still on the commentary team, so that's coming up in December. Um, all right, let's get to the middleweight little Grand Prix. We're at nearly, you know, 50 minutes, Spence. Turns out we can talk about stuff. Turns Spence. out. Turns yeah. out we have a good good little rapport here. Okay, so um, middleweight breaking news last week, main event February 10th at the Apex. Joe Pfeiffer will fight Jack Hermanson in a five-round main event. This is very much uh, the next step in the Joe Pfeiffer hype train, and he's getting a chance to join the top 10. I'm going to pull up the top 10 rankings. Can you pull up the top 10 rankings, Spence, and we'll get that on the screen so you can play a little matchmaker in the middleweight division because I think it's uh, uh, there's just a lot of fresh, fun matchups, new names in the, in the mix. So here we go at middleweight. Sean Strickland is the champ. Um, and as we go down, so Adesanya says he's going to be out a while, Spence, right? And then Drikas is going to fight Strickland in uh, January, right? So we got Whitaker, Cannoneer, Vittori, Costa, Brendan Allen, Hamzat Chimaev in the top 10, all without a fight. Hermanson's at 10. Joe Pfeiffer's going to fight him in February. That'll be a bit of clarity, but that's kind of a 10 to 15 situation for now. Robert Whitaker was to fight, I believe, Roman Dolidze, right? Wasn't that the matchup at UFC Austin this week? Yep. But there was an injury there. Um, can it, no, or was it Cannoneer was supposed to fight Dolidze? Cannoneer was supposed to fight Dolidze at UFC Austin. That didn't happen. Uh, Paulo Costa was supposed to fight Hamzat Chimaev in Abu Dhabi. That didn't happen. So, and then Robert Whitaker has been out since he fought Drikas Duplessis at International Fight Week, and uh, he got finished in the second round, and that's why DDP is getting the title shot. Brendan Allen is now an entry, okay? And Hamzat Chimaev is off of a win in the middleweight division over Kamaru Usman. 
I am glad that they didn't rush him into a title shot. Mm-hmm. Um, just, you know, I think a lot of people would have had a problem with a welterweight beating a welterweight and then fighting for the middleweight title when he wasn't, you know, in the top 10. What do we think? Um, Dolidze is fighting. Who's Dolidze fighting? He's got a fight coming up. I don't believe he has a fight booked. Let me check this really quick. Well, and check out who, who Dolidze is fighting. He was he's got, meant to he's fight got uh, Jared Cannonier at one point. Dolidze is fighting Nasordini Mavov. That's what I just had to scroll down. Okay. So se- that's a 7 12, and that's early next year. Uh, I think it's sometime in February, and I don't know if it's a main event um, or not. I think they're still kind of deciding on that. Not really sure. Is that correct, though, Spence? Fact check. Let me know if I'm wrong on that. But I okay. believe that just got announced in Mavov, or it's rumored Mavov is going to fight Dolidze. What we have is Whitaker. Cannoneer, Vittori, Costa, Brendan Allen, Hamzat, Shimaev. You got six names there, Spence, right? And obviously, some they could fight down. I don't think Brendan Allen should have to fight down. Gastelum's at 11. He's fighting at welterweight Sean Brady this weekend. Paul Craig's at 13. He just lost. Chris Curtis. Chris Curtis's got a fight, too. Who's Curtis fighting? That's another one I got to figure out. Um, apparently, he's got a fight in January, I believe, on the pay-per-view in Toronto. The question to me, Mark Andre Burial is who. There we go, Mark Andre Burial. So he's fighting out of the rankings. The question to me is, do we keep the Paulo Costa Hamzat Chimaev matchup together and figure out a date and location, or do we move on from that right now and test Chimaev against somebody else? The other question is, Brendan Allen's at eight. Who does he fight? How high up in the rankings do you give him, knowing that they're all fresh matchups for Brendan Allen? Mm -hmm. Now. There's also a factor of Chimaev is a big money fight and a big spotlight. We're going to Saudi Arabia in March. Hamza Chimaev's, I don't have no inside baseball on this, but like Hamza Chimaev's probably fighting in Saudi Arabia. It's like almost a definite. I don't know how much you'll see Hamza Chimaev fight in the United States due to different factors. But um, uh, so let's say Chimaev's fighting in Saudi Arabia in a high profile spot, either a co main event. Main event, maybe on that card, probably not a main event, though, probably a co-main event or some sort of featured fight on what's going to be a big fight night card in Saudi Arabia. What do you think, Spence? You put him against Costa over there and, and try to keep that together. Is that a fight that you want to see enough? Well, you know, so Chemayev has fought, what, twice in the last two years, both times in Abu Dhabi. And yeah. uh, let's just keep that trajectory going forward for the future. The Paulo Costa matchup was... um originally was was set six months in advance at first um it was he was then broken up to get uh ikram alaskar off a matchup with paulo costa that right. then got broken up and rebooked with chemaev so it's clear that they want to see this matchup with hamzat chemaev and paulo costa and that would reveal a lot about Kamzat's chances at middleweight if you put him up against a guy like paulo costa um but i think that uh what would be even more interesting is a matchup between Robert Whitaker and Paulo Costa. Both of them are dudes who have fought Israel Adesanya and lost. They are mm-hmm. both uh, top tier middleweights, and I just think that stylistically that matchup brings a lot uh, brings a lot to the table. Otherwise, okay. I would have Kamzat Chemaev go and fight Jared Cannon here. I think if you're trying to legitimize Hamzat Chemaev at middleweight, it's pretty hard to deny him if he gets a win over Jared Cannon here. Do you, see, okay. do, you, do you agree with either of those two bookings? So, so Whitaker Costa, I like it, right? Yes. Um, Whitaker Costa, and then what was the other one? I like Chimaev and Cannoneer. Chimaev against Cannoneer nine versus four, and then that leaves Vittori to fight Brendan Allen. That's and and you know what, Brendan Allen has lost twice in the UFC. That was first to Sean Strickland, and then yep. to Chris Curtis. And if you could book him against Marvin Vittori, that completes the trifecta. All three of those guys train at Extreme Couture in Las Vegas. And right. they're all teammates. I think that um, a real test for Brendan Allen would be against guys who know how to have success against him. And I think Vittori would represent that. I think that um, it would build up some heat with Sean Strickland, if that's yeah. what he's looking for. Yeah. And uh, I think that that could be a really good step for Brendan Allen moving forward. Yeah, I don't hate any of those matchups. Uh, Costa, Whitaker, Cannoneer, 
Chimaev, Vittori, Brendan Allen. I don't hate it, Spence. Now, is it a problem that Cannoneer would have to wait until we go to Abu Dhabi? Uh, or Saudi Arabia in March? Saudi well, Arabia. I mean, he was supposed to be in Austin, and he I think the injury was on his side. So I don't think that's a big problem. You know, it's March 2nd. Uh, that's going to come pretty quickly. Like, like all of a sudden we're going to blink. It's going to be the end of the year. And then you're talking eight weeks out from March 2nd, essentially. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't think that that's enough to, uh, that's too long to keep, to ask Cannoneer to stay on the shelf. I think what's exciting is like the first six months of next year is going to bring a lot of middleweight movement in a good way. Uh, I also, something just when Brendan Allen won his last fight over Paul Craig and he looked as great as he did. Um, I think the timeline works and I think the nastiness works. I think it would really help Brendan Allen and his star potential if he's going to win this fight to go to Saudi Arabia and fight Hamza Chimaev. Like, I, I, for some reason, I want to see that fight. I think Allen, uh, he's kind of to himself. He's not a big trash talker, but I think he's kind of starting to feel that. Like, I think he's just starting to be like super um, confident and who he is and really like buying all the things that he brings to the table as a real contender for the belt, because like, he's a guy again, like, uh, um, <clears throat> like Armand Sarukian, 27 years old, you know, Brendan Allen's, I think he's 27. I think he's going to turn 28 years old in December. A lot so of experience too. yeah, a lot of experience broke into the UFC young has largely won his way up and earned his way into this spot. The only problem is like he's eight. Should he have to fight nine? No, but like, would you rather fight six or like, would you rather fight Marvin Vittori on, on a fight night card in a headliner at the apex or in, you know, something like that? Or is it better for his career to go to Saudi Arabia to fight Hamza Chimaev and get a win on a big high profile card in what would no, no doubt about it be a massive fight, high profile fight. Maybe they make it five rounds type of co-main event type of thing you know yeah i think so I, so i, I think i think for brendan that. allen but but i do like your idea because i like mixing in old versus new in terms of who we've seen at the top of the heat for a while and who's upcoming so like whitaker costa is kind of guys that have been there and circling like i don't hate um yeah it's, it's tough because like whitaker has fought cannoneer he's fought and beat vittori and then all of a sudden, you're, are you asking Whitaker at three to fight Brendan Allen at eight or Hamzat mm -hmm. Chimaev at nine? That might be like a little disrespectful to a, guy, a former champion like that. But again, they're like high profile fights. I mean, the maybe the best fight to reinvigorate Whitaker's career if he wants to be a title challenger again is to beat Hamzat Chimaev impressively. That That's something that we haven't discussed you know? here. I mean, between those three matches... Um, for what, what would you think about Allen versus Robert Whitaker? I mean, you, you said that it might be a little disrespectful, but if you're Allen, do you, would you take that over a uh, Hamza Shemaya fight, for instance, Allen versus Whitaker? I like a lot on the road. Like you give Whitaker, I don't know when we're going to Australia next year, but we're definitely going at some point. Uh, I think maybe multiple times. So Brendan Allen gets a chance to step up and, and, uh, I don't know if it's a fight night headline against Robert Whitaker in a middleweight main event as eight, trying to get himself in the top five. And then for Whitaker, you ask him after he got finished um, to, after all these years, defend his spot in the top five and give the opportunity to one of these up-and-coming guys. Uh, like, hey, you're going to get the home game. We're going to give you your flowers in, in Australia. You've performed well there largely. Um, but now, it, you know, we're going to see what's what with Brendan Allen. I, I don't hate that matchup either. Um. I, I like the idea. So of... so I like I like I like I like Whitaker versus Costa because it's two guys that have been there done that. Costa is just such a wild card, man. You don't know what you're gonna get. You don't know how motivated he is. Is he gonna make weight? Like, do you put him on a pay per view card, or do you, he's certainly a big enough draw where you can headline him? Um, we're going to Brazil at some point next year. I think in the first half of the year, he probably could just sit out and headline Costa, or is he only a pay per view guy because he's that big of a name and he's his fights are exciting and he's fought for a title before. Um, Chimaev's, let's say Chimaev's fighting in Saudi Arabia. And the question is, do you give him Brendan Allen next to him in the rankings or more likely, um, maybe more likely, do you give him somebody in the top five to boost him up? Right. I almost like 
the idea of three through five, those guys that have been around fighting those eight, nine, right? Like, like I, give the, give the opportunity to a guy like Allen, who's on a, a very impressive win streak and a guy like Chimaev, who's got major star power. Th- do they get chances to jump into the top five by fighting a Marvin Vittoria? If you're Brendan Allen, uh, Jared Cannonier, if you're Hamza Chimaev, I don't hate any of those matchups. I think the first one, the first trio that you put together might make the most sense. Well, I, I like uh, what you're laying out here, old versus new top guys versus seven, eight, nine right now, just because I have a feeling that the, that guys like Chimaev and Allen are going to meet up later on down the road. Anyway, I think if we're, they continue in their trajectory, the way Very they are true. right now, like Very true. don't burn a, that match right now. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I think that, I think that that will manifest pro- possibly in a much bigger matchup later on down the road anyway. Yeah. And then like, so let's keep in mind too. Um, I imagine that Joe Pfeiffer is going to be the betting favorite against Jack Hermanson. So, like, as we're looking on the screen here, eight, Brendan out Al- seven is Roman Dolidze, who's going to fight Nasordini Mavov. Um, eight, Brendan Allen, nine, Hamzat Chimaev, 10, Jack Hermanson for the moment could be Joe Pfeiffer in another three, four months. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden, like, you have a really fun batch of possible fresh matchups between new contenders and veteran contenders. Yeah. Yeah. I like, I like, I like middleweight a lot right now. One, one other, yeah. Middleweight is very exciting right now. And uh, one other one that I'm curious to get your thoughts on, on this, because it seems like they're taking the, I don't know, for lack of a better word, Sean O'Malley route with Bo Nickel. What, what about, what would you think about Delize and Bo Nickel at this point? Yeah, I, I don't hate that. I mean, Delize has got to get through Nasruddin Mavov. I do want Bo Nickel to fight somebody ranked. Like, I just like it's time, right? He's been on the roster for a year. He hasn't fought too much. He's already saying, like, I have better wrestling than everybody. I would beat Hamza Chimaev. So let's throw him in there, right? Like, like I think it's time, um, you know, and, and like the cards haven't fallen his way in terms of matchups. And like you said, like they're being careful with him. You don't want to throw him against somebody that's going to take the, the wind out of his sails. But at the same time, like at what point is it time to test him? against somebody and like you got anthony hernandez in the top 15 certainly bo nickel should have his chance to join the top 15 and that's no slight at fluffy hernandez but it's just like bo nickel he's a pay-per-view only guy like they want him to fight in front of trump in las vegas on the biggest cards of the year let's give him somebody let's give him somebody here you know i agree yeah you hear people coming out saying bo nickel could beat anybody in the world right now and once yo how about bo nickel against chimaev in Saudi Arabia. One of those guys is going to sink or swim and whoever does gets immediately shot to very, very high stratosphere. As far as star power goes, the only thing is with that matchup, I mean, you're saying right now, uh, Tremayev is facing issues because he beat a welterweight to get into the middleweight rankings. Now you're having him beat an unranked middleweight. Does that shoot him higher up the card? I don't know if we're talking about who's, uh, what what the p- promotion wants both yeah. of those guys are a-list names i think that i that's, would love to see that honestly match. that's me talking out of my ass in terms of that matchup. <laughs> that will not happen uh th- i think they'll continue to give bo nickel regardless of opponent they'll give him kind of uh supportive environments i don't yeah. think they'll send him on the road to like abu dhabi to fight you know somebody over there to fight hamzad in saudi arabia they're not going to do that to him quite yet maybe they will in the future who knows just remember they're all chasing Sean Strickland. My man. Sean All right, Strickland. let's move on, Spence. Uh, what else do we got here? Let's, you know what? Let's go to some listener ask mail. Yeah, let's, let's, let's go ask to ask. Let's go to ask the fits, and we'll wrap up the show on that. Uh, so we don't take up too much of everybody's day. But um, the reason why it's called Ask the Fits is because somebody sent me a uh, message on Instagram, got in the old DMs, and said, Can I get some? Uh, can I get some tips from the fits for a first time MMA commentator? And I was just like, Oh, the fits. And then people in the comments said, I liked, I like it. I think tips with the fits is a cool segment name, whatever. So ask the fits and, uh, send me in whatever questions you have. This can be about MMA. This can be about UFC. This can be about hockey, huge hockey fan, right? Grew up playing. My son's playing now. I'm like back at the rink all the time. And I love it. And Safe Saud gave me this Boston hockey sweatshirt. Shout out Coach Safe. 
Um, so ask me about sports, ask me about life, ask me whatever you want, slide in the DMs, comment on YouTube, whatever. I tend to see what the interaction is with anybody out there listening and watching and asking me stuff. So ask in all forms. I'm easy to track down on social media and otherwise. Spence, we got a few. Read both of them. Read both of them because they're kind of in the same mind frame. I'll give a quick wrap up on it. But really what I want this segment to be is more like, you know, this is your, anybody who's listening or watching, this is your permission slip to ask me whatever. Okay, go ahead, Spence. Okay. Ask the Fitz. This is Drew Elder from Instagram. Do you have any suggestions for someone trying to break into MMA commentary? I'd love to do what you do. I fought before on the amateur circuit. I was a radio TV major in college, and I still currently train jiu-jitsu as well. Just curious if you have any advice for someone trying to accomplish a dream of doing what you do. Thank you so much. There we go. Okay, so that's Drew Elder from Instagram. And then uh, what's the next one? We've got Jill via Instagram as well, or Gil. Hey, Brennan, I'm only 17. I train, and I've been really passionate about it. And I'm at the point where I want to get a job in the world of MMA and do something similar to you. What was your pathway to success? All right. So I'm going to put a clip up of this from a previous episode. Spence, as you know, like I answered this, right? Do these three things to kind of start down the path to what I want to do. Um, Like, Spence, like, what would you say? Because you're carving a path a little bit in the media. Like you worked for the UFC. You're on the media side. You're not in front of the camera so much yet and like calling events. But I got to tell you folks out there, like I don't know what it takes. Here's what it took for me to be a UFC commentator. It took being an ESPN broadcaster that was looking for a job, like that got laid off. But I had proven that I was in the upper echelon of being a sports broadcaster, studio host, play by play, whatever. That's how you get the audition. You don't get the audition by like calling up the UFC and saying, do you have any jobs available? Or like, Hey, I trained jujitsu and I'd really love to call fights, blah, blah, blah. Like, like you gotta have experience. Like they want the best of the best. So I always tell people like, don't be the fan that says like, I just want to work for the UFC. I'll be a janitor. It's just like, guess what? We're not looking for janitors, right? Like that, we don't want fans that just want to be inside the building. That won't be fulfilling to you and it doesn't help our business. If you want to be a PR person for the UFC, well then go out and be a badass PR person. Like go be some of the best PR people, person, whatever on the planet, carve your path up, working for a college, small university, minor league teams, all that other stuff. If you want to be in sports PR and then after a certain point, you're like, hey, I'm a huge UFC fan and this is my PR resume, then you got a pretty decent shot. That's what you have to be. So that's like my overarching thing is like whatever you want to do, whatever you want to be for the UFC, you have to be world class at that. In the same way, if you want to be a team doctor for an NFL team, you better be a pretty freaking good doctor. If you're a bad doctor that has little training, but you're a huge Vikings fan, Vikings don't want you. If you don't know anything about the NFL, but you're like a guru on sports injuries and athletic medicine, then that's who wants you. So that's like my simple way for any teenager or any college student or whatever that's like into jujitsu. We don't want fans like fans help. Like a guy like you, Spencer, like help that you train jujitsu. We're into MMA, love the UFC, but your skill set gets you in the door. And then your skill set coupled with being a huge fan. But there's a lot of UFC fans out there that would love to make their living in the UFC, especially calling fights. I get this question like a billion, like this is the question I get the most. So when you're sending questions, don't send in this question because I've already answered it on past podcasts. And like, here's, but I just wanted to address it because I had these, these messages and I was going through my Instagram messages over the weekend. But it's like, and I'll, again, I'll put it on my YouTube channel. I basically listed three things in the past of like what you can do. Number one is you got to love broadcasting more than you love any particular sport. Um, number two, you got to go get some sort of training, like kind of formal. Doesn't have to be a four year prestigious university. You don't have to go to Harvard and rack up $200,000 in student loans. You don't have to go to Syracuse Newhouse School of Broadcasting or Arizona State or some of those bigger broadcasting schools. But it sure does help when you go to a program like that and you can cover college sports at a high level and then you can apply it to like the area of what you like the most. And then um, start a side project. Me and Spencer yapping on uh, yapping on a podcast like it really doesn't take any 
any extra training to turn your phone at yourself and start making videos. Spencer does that on his Instagram on BJJ Shack. He's starting to make jujitsu content because he's into jujitsu. He wants to start a jujitsu gym. He wants to have a coaching program. He wants to pursue a career in the world of jujitsu. So he's starting it now because you know there's no excuse not to. So those are the three things. And uh that's what I got Spence on those. Yeah. Yeah. Similar answers to the last time, but true nonetheless. True. Yeah. Yeah. All right, think. Spence. Hey, can I say this was a heck of a lot of fun? Did you have fun, Spencer? Hey, it was a lot of fun. A lot of fun. This is good, right? Thanks for being my co-host. Production help. Spence has been chopping up Instagram reels and TikToks behind the scenes for me for well, several months now, six months or more. Yeah, and like uh, so excited to, to get, get the camera on you, Spence. I said like, yeah, let's go 30 to 50 minutes. And we went an hour 10, you know, or, or thereabouts. So we'll work on our brevity maybe in the future. And, uh, but you know, we'll be back next Monday. Here's my hope for next Monday. I'll be fresh off of UFC Austin. We'll recap all the happenings. Maybe look ahead to the Shanghai card. I'll probably have some uh, fun stories from the road and we'll try to sprinkle in an interview. I'm calling the event with Bisping and Daniel Cormier. Megan O'Levy uh, will be part of our crew as well. And obviously there's going to be a bunch of big name fighters around. I'm going to touch base with Calvin Cater. So next week, We'll probably sprinkle in an interview in the 10 to 15 minute length in addition to our UFC Austin recap. And we'll see how this new version of Fitz Nation goes, Spence. What do you think? Sounds like a plan, my man. Have some right, fun buddy. in Austin. Everybody, thanks, buddy. it was a pleasure. Thank you very much. All right, so special thanks to Spencer Shackle, new co-host, uh, producer, whatever we want to call him. I've also talked about, uh, before I get too long-winded, having a UFC fighter kind of join as like a rotating co-host. So plans are in the works folks but uh until next time for spencer brendan fitzgerald's here thank you as always for watching listening to fitz nation and i'll talk to you soon